a very good afternoon to uh, all uh, audiences and all iscians uh, i bring greetings from the isa leadership and on behalf of the isa leadership i dr nishan sai a distinguished professor uh, in the department of anesthesia welcome you all for this uh, on isa online pg classes these pg classes are held every monday from 5 pm and uh, eminent speakers from all over the country spare their valuable time uh, to teach the young post graduates and the young anesthesiologists uh, about uh, topics of uh, importance for their post graduation exam and in this series today is no different we have a very eminent speaker and it is my proud privilege to introduce dr uh, surinder mohan sharma sir dr surinder mohan sharma sir is chairman anesthesia in the medanta the medicity gurugram and uh, he has done his graduation and post graduation from molana sahab medical college delhi he is the consultant at sir gangaram hospital in new delhi the executive director anesthesia of fortis hospitals sir has a special interest in orthopedic anesthesia acute and chronic pain management and acupuncture uh, sir is the past president of the isa delhi state branch a trustee of the indian college of anesthesiologists is a fellow of the indian college of anesthesiologists and the founder secretary of the indian society of medical acupuncturists so a very warm welcome sir and sir will be discussing about the perioperative concerns in a patient scheduled for orthopedic surgery sir as is the norm uh, normally what we do is we keep all the uh, audience and the listeners muted till the time your talk is going on all the listeners are encouraged to ask their questions and queries in the chat box just in case there are any questions that uh, dr uh, surinder sir wants wishes the audience to ask answer the answer can be put on the chat box itself uh, in the, this whole duration all the uh, listeners will be muted and once uh, the talk by dr sharma sir is over uh, we'll have a chance to discuss all the questions at the end so uh, with your permission sir uh, maybe uh, maybe start Anishan, thank you for the warm introduction of the speaker, and it's a pleasure and honor to have Dr. S. M. Sharma sir on board with us, talking about the one of the two classes on orthopedic anesthesia, and he shall be talking about perioperative management of patients scheduled for orthopedic surgery. And next week we have to have we have a back-to-back -back class by Dr. K. K. Mubarak from Kerala on anesthetic considerations on a patient scheduled for T. H. R. and T. K. R. so i'm very sure that these two classes will cover the subject of orthopedic anesthesia over to dr s m sharma sir please thank you so much for kind words and nishant please mute all yes sir So you are muted, sir. You need to unmute yourself, Doctor Surinder, sir. Good evening, friends and colleagues from Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. Thank you, organizers, for giving me an opportunity to uh, be here with you and and share with you some of the thoughts on perioperative considerations in a patient scheduled for orthopedic surgery. In this, what we are going to do is uh, basically orthopedic anesthesia is nothing any uh, any majorly different than uh, the general anesthesia or any other specialty. Like the patient remains similar in most of the situations, but there are some situations which are specific to orthopedics. So my this talk would be not getting into many other things of other specialities which are being discussed and with the, our colleagues and by my colleagues and the teachers. Uh, we'll be concentrating more in this uh, talk on uh, orthopedic related issues and. Uh, beginning with general issues uh, in orthopedics whatever we have and how 
do we go ahead uh, with pre anesthetic management or anesthetic management and what are the post operative considerations and specific concerns which we have is positioning or fat embolism or embolism uh, fat embolism syndrome or bone cement implantation syndrome or uh, tunicates so these uh, three four special concerns will be given special uh, attention uh, in this talk spine has not yet been included which probably will have to will be having another uh, uh, talk in which we'll be discussing uh, the spine some of the pain uh, management techniques uh, of the regional anesthesia so these topics uh, uh, will uh, you know go on to be some other uh, some other day when we have next talk like in the next uh, talk uh, next week we are having a joint replacement uh, total knee and total uh, hip replacement which will be discussed so basically all these talks would be discussing these things at various points of time now when we want to discuss with the <clears throat> discuss the management or the issues in any uh, specialty so there will be issues which are either patient related disease related or surgery related so that will make uh, some other issues little different from other specialties like in uh, in the uh, in these uh, orthopedic patients uh, we can will be having two types of patients which will be of little concern the patient uh, related factors like geriatric patients and pediatric patients like in geriatric patients as we all know there are physiological changes all body functions are you know either uh, affected uh, marginally many a times few of the functions are affected majorly in the disease form as well like uh, we may have a liver function test report saying everything looks normal but the liver reserves or the kidney reserves or the lung reserves or the cardiac reserves are marginal so all these factors would be affecting the management of anesthesia of these patients and we have a lot of geriatric patients coming in terms of uh, joint replacements in terms of fractures and uh, they need uh, specific uh, uh, specific uh, management uh, issues and then these geriatric patients which we have the most of them as i said they are their functions are restricted so they get used to a kind of life where the activities are restricted they don't walk fast they don't walk too much they just get up from the bed do their uh, uh, daily routine go on bed and they are hardly moving because one they don't have energy number two they they have that kind of i mean acclimatization to whatever uh, strength they have and many of them are bedridden so their problems would be added on to because of these or sometimes we have pediatric patients in and in, uh, in orthopedic anesthesia for orthopedic uh, anesthesia where they have some congenital anomalies or syndromes like osteogenesis uh, osteogenesis imperfecta or they have muscular dystrophies they have cerebral palsy so those things add on to some specific issues which would need to be addressed uh, accordingly like in osteogenesis imperfecta the bones are so brittle and like if you see the uh, photograph of the child uh, which is there showing the limbs of lower limbs of the child they are all turned around left right and centers they are you know in different directions so they need a very careful handling and their uh, uh, system has to be uh, very delicately managed so that we don't cause further harm to the patient now uh, there are other patient related uh, this thing uh, issues as we discuss as we discussed before uh, like in uh, patients who are geriatric or who are pediatric there is a difficult communication geriatric patients they can't listen they, ca they can't hear they are little confused they don't want to communicate they, they are even depressed so getting information out of them in terms of pre anesthetic assessment is a little difficult 
but then we have to do it patiently so that we try and get as much information from the patient as well as relations. Patients' relations generally are not many a times or most of the times as the things are progressing in our society. Uh, they are uh, not conversant with what medicines they are taking. Are they taking medicines or not? When they have eaten or not? Because they're busy, either they're not staying with them or they only meet them occasionally or, you know, very uh, uh, less uh, communication between uh, the patient and the relations. So many a times we don't even know what was the last meal taken or when the last medicines were taken or what medicines they are taking. And then again, it is very difficult to assess them in terms of cardiopulmonary reserves because they have restricted activity. So what they say is that I have no problem. I'm doing my all, all jobs. I have, I have no pain chest. I have no breathlessness, nothing. But then he's not moving uh, enough to let us, uh, to, uh, for us to get an idea whether the activity which is there is enough just only for his work or uh, it's lacking a lot. Then they have multiple comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, asthma, thyroid, and all those kind of issues in their body. And like in any other anesthesia, we have to address them, get information about them and analyze them. Uh, then we have patients having medications, especially the orthopedic patients. Many of them are on steroids. They're taking opioids because of uh, orthopedic problem or there are some uh, uh, malignancy issues. And they are taking all these opioids already beforehand. So we have to take that in considerations. Antihypertensive and cardiac medicines which they are taking and diabetes status, what diabetic status is, what anti-diabetic they are taking, when have they taken it before they came to us or uh, uh, otherwise. Then they are on antiplatelets because of uh, many reasons or anticoagulants. Some of them are on immu immunosuppressants like patients with rheumatoid uh, disorders. Uh, they get uh, disease modifying agents, which are basically immunosuppressants. So we have to take them, that into consideration also. Then there are issues which are disease related, as I said, uh, like uh, the orthopedic problems like rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, which comes with age. And many are patients which come to orthopedic OPD have issues related with these uh, problems. Now, if we see a patient of rheumatoid arthritis, what we have is that airway is also a, a problem for an anesthesiologist like there is a limited uh, TMJ movement or the glottis opening is narrow, atlantoaxial uh, instability. So while we are intubating and the movement of the neck, that can be a dangerous uh, thing if not taken care of. And uh, we, uh, uh, in these cases, have neck x-rays done so that we can see the status of the spine, uh, uh, cervical spine. Then they have issues with their heart related to pericarditis because of the disease process with some pericardial fluid, which may have some tamponade kind of a situation developing. Or they have Joglin syndrome involving eyes. They have gastric ulcers. Lungs, lung functions, as I said, we cannot most of the times uh, find out about the adequacy of these functions and the reserves because they are doing indulging in a very limited activity. But when we are talking to them, uh, in terms of uh, when they're talking to us, they get breathless and we can make out breath holding test. All these things as we do, then we can get an idea of uh, their lung status because whatever is there in the pre-operative period is going to affect their operative and post-operative uh, outcome. And then most of these patients, because of the pain, they are on NSAIDs or painkillers which leads to renal insufficiency in many a patients of which they are unaware of because many a times when the patients come from for joint replacements or orthopedic uh, uh, treatment, when their renal function test is done, then we find they are in a state of chronic renal failure. 
So we have to take care of all these things in the preoperative period. Now, uh, we, have uh, we have joint deformities which affect the anesthesia part also because we want to do uh, say tests, uh, uh, sorry, we have to do blocks or neuroaxial block. We have to position them. It, they're very difficult to position because they are stiff and uh, they are not moving in the direction which we want them to. They're not curved in the direction which is congenial to an anesthesiologist in uh, carrying out his activities. Their necks, neck and uh, uh, head and uh, all these uh, parts, they're in such a situation where getting into the, uh, the act of intubation is uh, quite a difficult proposition. And then renal insufficiency related to tonic use of NSH. Then in uh, ankylosing spondylitis, we have difficult airway problems. And some of them are actual real uh, difficult airways. And we need to have specialized uh, treatment for all this. Because the movement of their cervical spine may be restricted. Their TM joint doesn't open uh, as much as we need to so that the mouth opening is quite restricted. And many a times uh, we see these patients with hardly any movement of neck and the head is fixed in such some situation where uh, it is not congenial for uh, intubation. But then we have to take uh, this uh, into consideration before taking up uh, taking these patients for uh, anesthesia. Then the regional anesthesia say, for example, we want to give them a spinal anesthesia, an axial block. All these spinal ligaments are ossified and it is very difficult or it is just not possible to put your needle through this. And many a times if it is done uh, not with the care, and an effort is made to get into the space as much as possible or just push in through. Many a times they bleed and then they have problem of hematoma formations as well. In some other patients, uh, some of the people get through uh, the uh, uh, through a lateral space or this space or that space, but then that, that's only a trying thing and uh, we shouldn't be too enthusiastic to put in our needle trying to get into space if we find that it's a bamboo spine kind of situation. Then there are extra skeletal manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis, like aortic insufficiency, the cardiac conduction abnormalities, uh, pleural effusion being there. So we should take care of these before we take them off for, for anesthesia and look for these things and try to optimize them before they are taken up for anesthesia. Now there are surgical related issues like again, as we discussed before, difficult regions or difficult airways, difficult positioning. Then the surgeries, many of the surgeries when they, when they are undertaken, there's a lot of blood loss because there are, I mean, the bones and the ligaments and the calcifications and uh, all these things when they are done, especially when the reaming, et cetera, is done, or there's a fracture of the bone, there's a lot of bleeding, which is very difficult to control at times. So blood loss has to be kept in mind. Then these patients have problem of getting hypothermic because as we have our theaters in the operation theaters in orthopedic OTs, many of them would, you, you, many of uh, you would have realized the temperature kept there is very low because cementing and all those things are to be done for which it is congenial to have a low temperature in the operation theater. And being old people, and then there is a lot of uh, fluid being done to wash the wound and wash the area. So all these things lead to hypothermic situations. So one has to take care of that. Then post-operative pain, because all these bones, bony uh, surgeries and joint surgeries, they are very, very painful and they need a proper post-operative pain management. Then uh, since it is involving, especially these lower limbs uh, and the pelvis, the incidence of DVT is, uh, and the thromboembolic phenomena is quite a lot. 
So DVT has to be kept in mind uh, while taking up these patients. And then we have this uh, specific problem, uh, not totally restricted to orthopedics, but quite common in orthopedics, that is fat uh, and thromboembolism. So we'll have this fat and fat uh, embolism syndrome also discussed later. And then we have bone cement cues, which is being done to fix the implants uh, and the, in the joints and in the bones. So this itself is a very specific thing because maximum time the uh, bone cement is used is in orthopedics. And we have problem of bone cement uh, implantation syndrome. And uh, it's a quite a serious thing when it happens. So it needs a very specific special uh, uh, care to prevent and to make sure that the patient doesn't suffer. And then we have tunicae, which is uh, quite often used in orthopedic surgeries to prevent the patients uh, to lose a lot of blood. So when we have this problem of uh, tunicae application and release, there are some issues involved, which we'll be discussing later in this talk. So just to put them together, uh, in this we have patient-related, disease-related, and surgery-related issues. Uh, all together, which we'll be going through now in the further talk. Now, when we talk about the preoperative patients again, a detailed history and examination, like in any anesthesia uh, preparation or preoperative uh, pre-anesthetic uh, checkup and all, uh, try and get as much information as we can, even though the patient may, be, may not be communicative, Many a times we do not get any history of patient taking any blood thinners or anticoagulants or any uh, other uh, um, comorbidity being treated. They do not give any information, but when we say, okay, show us the drugs, then they come out with that and there you find they are taking anticoagulants or uh, uh, antiplatelet agents. Many a times when we ask them, have you had any surgery? They say, no, I haven't had a surgery. And while we are examining them, we find that there's a sternotomy uh, thing there. Then he says, no, no, that is a heart surgery I had. That is okay. I have no problem. So we have to be very careful to get all these histories out of them. And uh, uh, while examining them, uh, coordinate all these things to find out the best uh, information about their patients. Now, these co coexisting disease, as we do in any other uh, specialty, any other spe uh, specialty anesthesia or uh, any other uh, uh, patient, we have to evaluate whatever coexisting diseases they have, what are their sugar levels or their blood pressure levels or their uh, level of uh, uh, coronary artery disease, the renal functions. And then we want them to be optimized before taking up. We cannot cure the diabetes, we cannot cure the hypertension, we cannot cure asthma, but when we take them up, what we can do is have them at the most optimum situation so that the complication rate in the, during the surgery and post-operative period is not there. One major thing which, uh, I mean, which is kind of uh, contention between an anesthesiologist and a surgeon is, the surgeons are pushing to get their surgery done. But then we have to tell them the post-operative issues or the post-operative complications which can take place also. Like there is a very old saying which says, if a patient is living at 21% oxygen given by God, he'll be very happy or he'll be fairly comfortable with my 100% oxygen. But then it is not only the surgery because the main aim is not doing a surgery. Main aim is getting the patient all right. So if we feel that, if we take it as not only that we have to do the surgery, but post-operatively as well, we have to have them back on their, uh, back on their feet uh, and doing their uh, normal functions. That is the main thing. And we have to keep that in mind and discuss with the surgical colleagues so that they are taken up only when they are optimized, if possible, and we have time, so that we have minimum complications in the post-operative period. 
now then patients who come for come with trauma they must be stabilized uh, uh, before taking them for surgery in whatever way it is possible in the limited time which we have like the patient is to uh, for surgery uh, for long bone fracture maybe a day after tomorrow or next day they should be stabilized in such a way that the chances of embolization fat embolism and all those things is limited we have to check again before we take up the patient we have to get the blood arranged and check the availability of the blood our cells before we take them for surgery because many a times you are told that patient is uh, uh, four units or two units or three units of blood have been arranged and when the patient is uh, in the operation theater surgery started you ask for blood and you find that the blood was arranged one week ago and now the blood bank has released that blood for some other patient so we have to make sure before we take up the patient that adequate amount of blood is available because when they bleed they can bleed a lot and lead to problems then investigations of the laboratory radiological ct scans mri cardiac cardiac evaluation is a little important thing in orthopedic patients uh, uh, because of various factors which add on to uh, their cardiac uh, morbidity like in like say x ray spine many a times the surgery is not to be done on the spine or maybe lower limb surgery is to be done we get a lumbosacral spine x ray done to see how the osteophytes and the uh, what is the status of the lumbosacral spine so that when we are looking into uh, or we want to give a uh, uh, neurexal anesthesia spinal or epidural then we know which space is available if there is any collapse of the vertebra or anything so that makes the whole process easier to uh, do now pre operative visit as any way any other surgery is mandatory because many a times especially in orthopedics we have to explain to them the position in which they would the surgery would be done because once they are uh, under block a uh, regional block and you want to put them in a particular position the patient says no i don't i cannot lie down flat i cannot lie down in lateral position or something or the other or i wouldn't like like to be lying down in prone position so we have to explain to them in the position so that they are mentally prepared for that we discuss anesthesia option with them what kind of anesthesia would they have or what kind of anesthesia would be giving what is good for them so that when they come to operation theater they are not the fear of unknown is a worst fear so once we have explained to them they are in a relatively quiet position and uh, at peace with the, their inner self and then we tell them regarding the post operative pain relief because when we take the consent we explain to them that we would be doing some durexel block or we will be giving them uh, intravenous uh, uh, patient monitored uh, pain killers so they should be explained to them what kind of uh, pain relief uh, would be given and what does uh, what should he expect on how how would he go ahead with the use of any machine or any appliance uh, if it has been used in the post operative period then cardiac medicines as per aha guidelines or the guidelines of the institution you are working with uh they are continued uh, as per the uh, guidelines anticoagulants as per the asha guidelines or the guidelines being followed in the institution and anti anti drugs or sedation as required many people in old people uh, in uh, do not want to use any sedatives or anti anxiety agents in uh senior uh, patients or uh, because it can backfire sometimes so we have to see according to the patient what is to be done how much to be given when to be given what to be given and that must be documented and thought over before that's been carried out now why we say that pre operative cardiac testing is mandatory because one is that we we do not know the functional status of these patients many of these orthopedic patients 
and the post operative cardiac complications can be limited if we take all these things into considerations like if we see that for in cardiovascular system there is increased risk of peri perioperative myocardial complication why because there are multiple comorbidities limited functional capacity increased blood loss and fluid shift so added on with post operative pain they all lead to tachycardia blood pressure increase in oxygen demand and the limited capability of the heart or with some uh, comorbidities they have they can have myocardial infarction in the post operative period and affect the life of the patient again then the respiratory considerations again we don't know how much they can walk without this but if you have done some tests pulmonary function tests and all those things in these patients do we know what is fev1 or closing volume levels or oxygenation uh, levels arterial oxygenation levels how low or high they are and if they have any hypoxia because of embolization of the bone marrow or debris to lung uh, subsequent to the injury or trauma they had so all of these factors will lead to post operative pulmonary complications like somebody who has a copd has a fracture with some embolization of bone marrow fat or something so it will be further complicated or asthmatic having these problems somebody with the pulmonary hypertension these problems will add on and they will lead to increased post operative pulmonary complications then these especially the patients in the advanced age group or those patients who are taking alcohol or those patients who already have some dementia or cognitive uh, function impairment or the patients who are on psychotropic medications when added on with perioperative events like hypoxia hypotension and all these things that leads to more confusion and delirium in these patients and some of them become violent they pull out their uh, iv lines they pull out their catheters they pull out their endotracheal the tube so all those things they happen so we have to take that consideration in mind and we have to make sure that in the perioperative period they have adequate sleep because sleep deprivation many a times like we have patients who are done under regional anesthesia and when they come to uh, the post operative area or the intensive care unit wherever they are taken to their one complaint is that i haven't even slept my surgery is over but i haven't even slept so, so once we have if we have told them they will be awake they will be only sedated mildly and then during night if they don't sleep next day morning they complain a lot of pain because the whole night they were awake and thinking about pain so the pain process adds on so we have to ensure all these things to make them comfortable and less confused and less delirium and the strategies which can use which we use to which we can use to reduce the post operative uh, delirium is like early mobilization because once the patient starts moving out of the bed that gives them mental strength and the stability of their thought process now they are getting better if the pain control is good and they can move around or they are comfortable in their bed the post operative delirium will be less again as i said maintenance of normal sleep cycle and try to avoid psychotropic medications unless they've been on it before and they need it uh, for their uh, normal well being they should be avoided especially the old people then blood loss monitoring is very important because there is a there are uh, surgeries which have lot of blood loss if we don't look for this or we don't monitor it many a times we may not be aware because all these people they have uh, i mean especially the old people or young people at pediatric pediatric patients they are uh, apparently looking to be stable their bp and everything is okay and then suddenly a stage comes when there is a sudden collapse of the patient uh, and then one realizes that oh there was a little bit of uh, extra blood loss so we should be monitoring it through the surgery and taking action accordingly then there are positions 
uh, uh, for some surgeries, which we like in prone position or something, or sometimes the, the head end is up or down or whatever. So all these positionings also affect the blood loss. So we should make sure whatever position is being done or being taken for the patient by the surgical colleagues is managed in such a way that it doesn't add on to blood loss. And then induced hypotension uh, is being done uh, in many surgeries, uh, like in uh, uh, joint uh, surgeries or in the surgeries of uh, endoscopic works. So that also adds on to controlling the blood loss. Some people uh, use intraoperative hemodilution and that makes sense that hemodilution uh, before the blood loss occurs so that if the patient is 13 gram hemoglobin, by hemodilution, they lose blood of 12 or 11 gram hemoglobin. And then uh, the loss is not as much as it would be otherwise. Autotransfusion is being done. Patients are called beforehand, before their surgeries accordingly. And their sam blood sample blood uh, is collected and preserved. So when they come for surgery, their own blood is being transfused. Or we have intraoperative cell and drain salvage uh, uh, techniques by which whatever blood loss is taking place that is being preserved and to be uh, infused later stage at later stage uh, once the surgery is done or during late during the surgery. Now one of the important thing in any surgery for any patient is the positioning because any patient even having a minor surgery in a supine position Positioning has to be taken uh, care of very, very uh, precisely. It, the positionings which we see most of the times in the orthopedics is safe, say, say supine position with or without sandbags or you know, towels and sheets under one side of the body and head up position or totally Trendelberg or reverse Trendelberg positions prone or semi-prone positions, lateral positions, B chair positions, sitting or neck flexion, all these, these being done by the surgical colleagues to make their approach to the operative area more comfortable and easy. But then that makes our job more difficult and we have to be very careful uh, so that we can take care of uh, all those issues which result from each of the positions. We'll discuss that later in this talk. Now, what we need to have in these positions is that we have to have arm board and arm boards and arm rests. Preferably palm up situation and arms tucked, maybe by the side or maximum, maximum 90 degrees, not more than that, so that the brachial plexus is uh, in a safe position. Padding under the elbows because the nerves may be pressed or the joint may be compressed. Finger positioning has to be taken care of. Many a times fingers are in such a situation, which is a very odd situation. So when they wake up, they complain of pain in the fingers more than the surgery they had. Then the position of the peripheral central IV lines, probes, cardiac electrolytes, wires, catheters, that must be taken care of every single time when the patient's positioned on the operating table. And then the blood pressure cuff. Many a times you find the blood pressure is very, very low. And then you find there's a kink in the tubing of the blood pressure uh, cuff. And that raises a false alarm and creates a situation which many of us would not like to be in. Now, when, once we have patients in say prone position, there are many issues in this prone position. taken care of properly will lead to the compliance issues of the chest. Then abdominal pressure. If the, there's a pressure on the abdominal wall in the prone position, then inferior vena cava can be pressed. There'll be venous engorgement and retrograde flow, and there'll be a lot of bleeding, especially in spine surgeries and uh, some other surgeries. Now, peripheral nerve damage can occur if we don't uh, position them properly and there's a traction or pressure on the limbs. 
So we have to be very careful that they are placed in a position where the brachial plexus or these things are not uh, stretched. Then we have, since in prone position, the face is down, eyes, ear, nose, facial nerves, all these uh, parts have to be taken care of, padded, and placed in such a situation there is no undue pressure on them so that when the patient wakes up, have problems of vision or problem of uh, compressed uh, cartilages. Breasts, they must be taken care of because compression can cause ischemic changes in a long surgery. Genitalia must be protected properly and make sure that they are not unduly compressed. Then IV lines, catheters, endotracheal tubes, tracheostomy tubes, all these things, when in prone position, they have to be taken care of so that they are not neither obstructed, kinked, and they are functioning properly and their lumens are not obstructed. As I said that, and everybody knows, prone positioning is face down. Head should be neutral or turned comfortably uh, as per the neck position, slightly or otherwise as required. But make sure that there is no stress or strain on the ligaments and there is no stress and strain on the spine, cervical spine. What we need, we need chest rolls, eyelid support, which should be well padded. Abdomen should be free so that the respiratory movements can take place and there's no compression of the inferior vena cava. Arms can be either by the side in prone position or they can tucked or they can be properly abducted or they can be raised, uh, flexed and raised as in the picture there. Elbows must be padded so that the nerves and the joint are protected. Eyes are closed and adequately padded and there's no undue pressure of the weight of the head. Then in the lateral position, what we need to do is that we have to have <clears throat> a line body. It should not be kinged or unduly, uh, unduly angulated to prevent the post-operative pains and aches taking place because of uh, ligaments and the tissues which are compressed. Neck should be in a neck, uh, natural neutral position with the help of the pillow and the pads. Axillary rolls must be kept under the uh, just under the axilla so that there's no pressure on the shoulders. And dependent arm should not be pressured. Make sure of that. Because many a times when the patient is in lateral position and the axilla is slightly posterior oriented, there is an acute bend of the axillary area. They, have, they can have a lot of problem in the post-operative period. And during the surgery also, you may have the, if the blood pressure or the IV line is on that hand, that can cause a lot of problem in terms of blockade. Then the non-dependent arm must be on a padded surface, padded between the, knee, between the knees, so that the upper uh, leg is not pressing on the knees, uh, the lower leg. And then the padding under the lateral aspect of the dependent leg so that the nerves are not pressed and post-operatively we have any neuroplexia or such situation. Then one, situ one position which is uh, specifically used by orthopedic surgeons for shoulder surgeries is a beach chair, beach chair surgery, beach chair position, uh, which is also known as a barber shop position, which was uh, found out uh, uh, or used in 1980s onwards. There is a sit-up angle of about 30 to 90 degrees. Appropriate padding is done in the pressure points. What advantages uh, the surgeons have is there's an excellent uh, surgical access and there is a limited brachial plexus traction. Arm rotation and uh, manipulation during the surgery is easier. And from our point of view, there is easy, easy transition from the beach chair position to the spine position if there is a surgical, uh, if there is an airway complication taking place so that we can access the airways uh, that way easily because patient can be uh, made supine uh, very, very fast. In this only problem, one of the major problem is the cerebral hypoperfusion. Why? 
because as we see in this picture here, the the head is located above the uh, heart level, and for every one centimeter rise of the head above the heart level, there is a drop of mean arterial pressure of 0.75 millimeters of mercury. And secondly, many a times or most of the times, the surgeons want hypotensive anesthesia because when they are doing endoscopic surgery, uh, any bleeding obstructs their, uh, uh, it makes it very difficult for uh, them to have uh, uh, good vision and their surgery gets affected. So they want, one is hypotension, secondly, they want a semi-sitting or sitting position. So one of the things which we use, which we should, which we should keep in mind is that perioperative uh, blood pressure should be approximately 80% of the resting pressure and preferably not below that. And we should take care of the pressure all through the surgery so that it doesn't go very low and we have a cerebral hypoperfusion problems post-operatively. Of course, from the surgical point of view, some of the areas like in the posterior part of the joint are not easily accessible in this. So most of the surgeons do those kind of surgeries in lateral position and for slap, like for slap repair, generally they prefer a lateral position than the beach wear position. Then we have patients who are fixed up in the fracture tables. Now, if you see the fracture tables and all of you who have, uh, who have worked on these tables, most of us have, if you see that one of the leg is flexed at the hip, at the knee, and then kept abducted in a position, rotated, and the other leg is straight, the surgical leg is straight, tied up. What it does is that it helps the surgeon to get a stable traction, easily manipulate so that they can do a close, uh, close reduction without uh, much pull and push. And when they are fixing up the joint, whatever position they fix, that stays there. So fixation is also easier. Then the C arm or the radiological uh, appliances, they can be easily moved in this position to get good radiological images without disturbing the sterile areas. And then the other joints of the body, like in the shoulder joint, elbow joints of the arm, um, both the arms, they can be kept in a very safe and stable position and uh, avoid any damage to them. And brachial plexus traction again, because they are kept in a stable position uh, is protected and then genitalia again are protected. Now, what kind of anesthesia technique uh, depends on the patient preference. Many of people have an idea that they don't want spinal anesthesia, especially the ladies who have had some cesarean in their lives or the social, uh, social line going on that this, is, this causes pain all your life and they are very skeptical about it. Many of patients in the, operati uh, in the operating uh, area I have seen were so worried about this. And when they have had the spinal anesthesia and they are told that this is over, they said, oh, it's all over. So we must discuss with them what actually they should expect, what, they should, uh, what you would be doing, what position you would be putting them in so that they are in a comfortable position. And then it also depends about the health status of the patient or the comorbidities or the problems they have. So what kind of anesthesia technique uh, you would be using. And duration of the surgery. Suppose the patient is going to have a very long surgery. So just plain, simple subarachnoid block is not the right option. So in those conditions, we would think of uh, putting in a catheter in the epidural space or as was generally done, or some people still do spinal uh, uh, catheters so that the duration of the surgery can be covered up. And then if there is a coagulopathy or the patient is on some agents which will cause bleeding issues, so all those will be also looked into what kind of anesthesia to proceed on. Regional anesthesia by choice is a very good thing. Uh, it, it has a lot of uh, 
options which we have uh, because are done on the limbs and the limbs are accessible to regional anesthesia very well. So a lot of surgeries, I mean, if we see the percentage of surgeries done in any operation theater in any specialty, probably in the orthopedic anesthesia, maximum regional anesthesia is being utilized because of the location of the parts which have to be treated. And it provides excellent intraoperative and postoperative analgesia because it continues in the postoperative period for some time or if some procedure has been done like putting in a catheter or some technique has been done to uh, give them a nerve block or, direct, uh, or a perineural block by virtue, by virtue of catheters. So that would continue in the postoperative analgesia in a continuous fashion and would be very comfortable for the patient. And the other advantages of regional anesthesia, as we all know, is the decrease in the loss. And then even some of the studies or many studies also say, I have proved beyond doubt that the incidence of DVT and pulmonary embolism and thromboembolic phenomena is lower in the patients who are done under regional anesthesia than in the general anesthesia because of less suppression of hypnolysis or decreased platelet degradation, hemodilution, early ambulation. Uh, then airway manipulation is avoided. Like if we have, say, case of uh, fixed neck, low, uh, I mean, uh, mouth opening is small, or some other reasons of thick neck or something. The manipulation of the airway, which might take place being a difficult airway is avoided because we don't even need to manipulate that. Uh, and that's a, an added point with this regional anesthesia technique. Again, when the patient is under regional anesthesia, patient is conscious. So they can help, they can help us in putting them in the most comfortable position so that the post-operative compression pains and stretches and all these things can be avoided because they'll be able to tell us if there is something is being stretched or pushed or uh, compressed. So that way, that will take care of uh, safety precautions. Then since we are not doing any uh, vent, uh, pressure ventilation, the effect on the circulation is much, much uh, taken care of. And then overall decrease in the stress response also adds on to the well-being in the post-operative period. One of the reason, I mean, uh, I'm not actually touching up the nerve blocks per se, because that's a different topic altogether, which has to be taken up in a different uh, manner. Uh, like upper limb, we have a lot of blocks and nerves. Lower limbs, we have all of nerve blocks. We have plexus blocks. We have all those things taking place. Uh, one of the things which is very unique is the intravenous regional anesthesia which uh, was uh, uh, started by Bayer. And this is a very uh, simple technique, a rapid onset of action. It's controllable durable of action and turn of function. So what you do is that you put in a cannula, you exsanguinate, you inject the local anesthetic agent, raise the tourniquet, do the surgery, and then 20, past 20 minutes, according to the surgery and according to this thing, whenever it is over, keeping the uh, time of uh, tunica application in mind, whenever the, you raise it uh, slowly and uh, carefully, the patient's movement and everything are back to, norm, back to normal. But the disadvantage will again be that its act, effect is only till the tunica is there, or the toxic effect of the drugs can take place because we are injecting in the intravenous uh, area. And when we release the tourniquet, some of it goes to the uh, uh, systemic circulation and can have effects. That's why we have to take care of not releasing the tourniquet for a particular amount of time, so at least for 20 minutes, and then uh, release it gradually. 
And another problem which happens with this is that it does not give rise to any post-operative analgesia because as soon as the local anesthetic goes into the uh, uh, general circulation, uh, pain start within few minutes. So we have to take care of post-operative analgesia separately. Now in the operation theater, as, we, as I said before, temperature control has to be kept in mind, warm air blankets, IV fluid warmers, warm fluids for lavage, because they've been doing a lot of lavage uh, in the joints and in the uh, bone fracture areas or the surgical areas. So if we have warm fluids for lavage, that will reduce the temperature of the body less. And OT temperature, as I said, we normally try to keep it low for uh, cases where cementing is to be done. So that has to be kept in mind. Sterility protocols have to be very, 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 very strict in the orthopedic operation theaters. So we, from our anesthesia point of view, also should uh, add on to that uh, sterility protocols because bone infection, once it takes place, is one of the very, very disturbing things for the person, for the patient, because it takes long time, a lot of efforts, and many a times amputations have uh, to be taken undertaken because the infection uh, does not respond to uh, antibiotics and goes on for a very long time and leads to amputations in the patients. Antibiotic prophylaxis, like in most of the surgeries, <clears throat> is given. It's, uh, it's even more important for orthopedic patients. But when we do this, uh, give these antibiotics, we please, please, please be, uh, uh, be aware that if we are using tonicate, antibiotic prophylaxis will be useful if we give it five to 10 minutes before the tunica inflation. Otherwise, whatever we give would be circulating in the rest of the parts of the body. And only when the tunica is released, that this antibiotic would be released. So the uh, whole concept of antibiotic prophylaxis would be lost. And then uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting prophylaxis because once we have a patient vomiting, whatever surgery, whatever we have done, that takes away the comfort of the patient and that uh, has a patient in a very difficult situation in terms of comfort. And uh, just a little, com little care in this direction if we take, they can have a very good, easy post-operative period because when, once we give them uh, analgesics, which are either opioid-based Otherwise, the incidence of uh, nausea and vomiting is more. Secondly, most of these patients of orthopedics, they have they are on some kind of analgesics or in the on the NSAIDs, so they have a problem of gastritis happening uh, day in day out of their lives. So any stimulus on the part of uh, medication or otherwise would lead to a lot of uh, nausea and vomiting. So we have to be a little extra careful in these patients. Now I'll touch up uh, these uh, special concerns, which I said uh, are very, very specific to the uh, orthopedic surgery. So one is the fat embolism syndrome. Now, uh, when we talk about fat embolism, well, it is said that practically all patients who have had a major trauma, long bone or pelvic fracture, or any replacement or tunica application, they all practically all have fat embolism taking place in uh, different proportions in their body. And it has been reported in up to 90% of the cases. But there's another thing which comes up with uh, this thing. Uh, fat embolism is the fat embolism syndrome, which is a little serious complication and has a high mortality rate. And this happens in about 30% of all these patients. There's increased medullary pressure. Why, it why this fat gets this thing is that there is increased medullary inter and intermedullary pressure. The damage happens to the venous sinusoids and the venous channels. And when there is manipulation because of the fracture movement or otherwise, and or by reaming 
when the surgery is happening these things the fat globules along with the bone marrow they get into debris they get into the venous sinuses venous channels into the circulation and they obstruct the uh, passages or the vessels in lungs and other parts of the body now what happens but what is this fat embolism syndrome is a particular specific kind of a syndrome which takes place it's a physiological response to fat within the systemic circulation as i said fat embolism takes place in all but in some cases because this gets broken into uh, free fatty acids that this kind of syndrome syndrome gets triggered and this happens because of the embolization of the fat in the bone marrow debris and once it goes into the uh, circulation then it causes mechanical obstruction of the capillaries of end organs like lungs and other places or triggering of a sars uh, kind of action because of the free fatty acids which are toxic to pneumocytes and capillary endothelium and that leads to a serious situation so once we are aware of this then we can take action accordingly earlier the better and how we do it let's see that now how do we know that uh, fes or the fat embolism syndrome is there there are some criteria which has been put up like some axillary or subconjunctival or uh, oral uh, petechial hemorrhages or hypoxia taking place uh, less than uh, arterial oxygen being less than 60 mm of mercury with a fio2 of 0.4 some patients who are conscious they suddenly become very uh, this thing confused and or they become depressed or they become unconscious or they talk st suddenly start talking irrelevant when they are under regional anesthesia so be careful that this is probably setting in and in many cases there may be a pulmonary edema so one of these major factors it happens with some of the minor things like tachycardia hyperthermia retinal fat emboli urinary fat and globules being there or platelets being low uh metocrit being low fat globules appearing in sputum if you do that uh, microscope test and increase in the esr so if you have one of them one major uh, of these criteria, uh, criteria being there and four minor then this is a full blown uh, fat embolism syndrome diagnosis now symptoms they generally happen between 12 and 72 hours after the injury and can range from mild dyspnea to frank coma but it is only that it happens only after this time many a times when there is an aggressive dreaming done or aggressive manipulation being done sometimes as i said during surgery itself the patients suddenly they deteriorate their saturation drops their uh, level of consciousness deteriorates they become confused and even go into coma and they go into collapse to the extent that they even have cardiac arrest so but of all these uh, symptoms and signs the arterial oxygen tension going low or hypoxia is the most consistent symptom of this uh, fat embolism syndrome they they will cause respiratory failure and severe neurological impairment in many a patients and even dic can happen in some patients in conjunction with fat embolism syndrome how do we handle this well prevention is the basic thing for this happens because early surgical reduction of the fracture and fracture immobilization done in the pre operative period as soon as the patient comes to the to the hospital or in the ambulance or at the place of injury and during the surgical time avoid dreaming wherever possible like those patients who have a choice of i mean in which surgeon has a choice of putting in a plate or doing uh, you know putting in a nail where reaming would be required and patient is 
uh, high risk patient like very obese patient and all and and that and long bone fractures of that kind which are bad and would need a lot of uh, reaming maybe they can think about putting in a plate instead of this thing or when they do reaming minimal reaming so that we can prevent it and then uh, once we once we are on to it our mind is there we do and uh, i'll recognize it early and as soon as we recognize it uh, we make sure uh, that we give them oxygen and take action and what we need to do is because they will have hypovolemia kind of a situation so we should have hypovolemia being uh, attended to oxygen being given and aggressive respiratory support to be given when we see this coming people have used steroids heparins dextrans uh, in this but not much support in terms of evidence for role of these in fes and overall mortality is high and it can be up to 20% in these cases the next disturbing thing which can happen in an orthopedic surgeon uh, surgery is uh, when we are using when the surgeon is using bone cement especially in the joint replacements or in the bone marrow canals so what is this bone cement implantation syndrome it is the it is characterized by the hypoxia hypotension uh, and loss of consciousness occurring around time of cementing or prosthesis insertion or reduction of the joint or occasionally limb tourniquet deflation when uh, the surgery is being done under tourniquet and has been done and when this is open this gas goes into the circulation so when ever there is a bone cement use again we have to be careful and we should be prepared to look into the symptoms situation of the patient whereby we can catch it fast and treat it start treatment as soon as possible now what happens is methyl methacrylate monomer is the one which is released when the uh, bone cement matures when this gets into the circulation this along with the embolization of the air which is in the bone marrow of the patient that rises because it heats up so it causes increased pressure in the uh, space in the bone marrow space so the air or bone marrow uh, clots they get into the venous channels and get into the body along with methyl methacrylate monomer which causes lysis of blood cells and this exothermic section uh, reaction which takes place also causes a marrow uh, uh, this thing uh, uh, lysis the blood cells and when this volatile monomer mma gets absorbed there is a there is a there is a anaphylactic kind of a reaction in the body there is a peripheral vasodilatation happening which is enormous and it can lead to fall in blood pressure uh symptoms uh, uh, of the nervous system and even cardiac arrest now if we see in the uh, arthroplasty patients where they put cement in the jo- in the uh, femoral or tibial areas tibial uh, lumen in cemented ones up to 680 mm of mercury pressure can take place whereas if uncemented were done it is less than 100 mm of mercury so when this immense amount of uh, pressure is being generated in the uh, total hip or total knee patients or in any other long bone or uh, wherever the cement is being used and the patient is uh, uh, neither uh, done under tourniquet immediately the absorption part will take place and will cause a reaction so all those patients with long stems which have to be put in a long stem prosthesis 
where large quantity of bone cement is being used or where the patient already has some problem of pulmonary hypertension copd and metastatic disease their risk factors are very high well some people in these patients who are very high risk they advise having intraoperative arterial line and cvp monitoring but most of the times we can uh, manage without that as well uh, provided we are aware of uh, this thing may happen and it has been documented by te that all the presence of bone debris in the uh, vessels and in the uh, in the uh, ventricles and the uh, uh, when the pictures are there which shows us how much bone debris moves in when these procedures are being done now there is a criteria which has been decided divided into grade 1 2 and 3 of the cement implantation in the grade 1 which happens in a lot of patients there is a moderate hypoxia saturation less than 94% or there is a hypotension of you know uh, systolic blood pressure of more than 20% between 20 and 40% and the saturation generally is between say 88% and 94% whereas in the grade 2 saturation drops below 88% and the hypotension is 40% of the uh, systemic systemic blood pressure to begin with and there is a unexpected loss of consciousness whereas grade 3 is when cardiovascular collapse happens and cpr is uh, called for now to prevent this what can be done is from the anesthesia point of view we have to make sure that the patient is optimized pre operatively and intra operatively with the volumes and everything and the systemic blood pressure is kept within 20% of the pre induction value we keep vasopressors with us ready and confirm awareness i mean being i mean the communication between surgeon and the anesthetist that the cement is being prepared and is being applied and cardio respiratory compromise must be looked for in the beginning itself so that any change happening should be immediately acted upon and the surgical team what they can do is keep the anesthetist informed about preparing and cement application they should wash and dry the femoral canal and lavage it before uh, putting in cement they put in a catheter just so that suction catheter in there and do suction before they put in the uh, cement and the processes so that whatever expansion takes place or whatever the intra uh, luminal pressure intramedullary pressure uh, rises there that is contained and they put in a plug uh, uh, as per the implant so that this does not spread into total uh, uh, intramedullary canal only and only contain to where the process is is going to be there and excessive uh, pressurization which is the main cause of this dissemination is also avoided so if we put in these things together we can say that optimal normal must be maintained some people give steroids and they find it uh, very good uh, they believe it helps so uh, available and ready if required and as i said bigel parasitical medullary canal use a catheter or intramedullary plugs and do retrograde cementing problem so that's not very much used these days and again vigilant monitoring fall in etco2 is the first indication under anesthesia so if the patient is under anesthesia we should be very careful management of the primary supportive things life oxygen and uh, uh, concentration to 100% to be given fluid to be given aggressively 
potent inotropic agents, including epinephrine and ventilatory support. So next, the last thing which comes is the tunique. So tunique, this is a history just for people who like to know this. This was first used in 1628 by William Harvey, who discovered how to put in a uh, round thing around the leg and this thing. And it was used in the wars in the past also. Uh, but the actual tunique kind of a thing was described when they thought from the French word turner, which means to turn. So they used to you know, tie it around for the tunique. And August Bayer was the one who used this two tunica technique, especially for IVRA. And now modern electronic systems are there, whereby its control is very good. Now it is a constrictive compressive control venous arterial circulation, so that the blood loss is less and the uh, extremity is you know, bloodless, and a good operating field is there. They may be non-inflatable like elasticized cloth or inflatable like pneumatic, pneumatic, uh, pneumatic uh, tunicas. And they use used in surgical settings, uh, sometimes in mass suits of use in the shock and trauma patients also. What are the contraindications? Suppose somebody has a se severe peripheral vascular disease, sickle cell disease, severe crush injuries, diabetic neuropathy patients, or the patients with a history of DVT or pulmonary embolism. There the tunica is relatively, I mean, there is no absolute contradiction with here. One should either avoid or use it with extra caution. Length should be three to six inches more or one and a half to one and a four to one and a half more than the uh, circumference of the limb, which is to be used, which should be more than higher, wider than half the limb diameter. Position is maximum higher, maximum circumference where it should be applied. Soft padding before applying to Nikkei. There are different shapes, rectangular or contours, as per the needs and the availability. Lower limb, thigh, or lower leg. Uh, uh, sometimes some people use in the lower leg also, but generally used in the thigh. In upper limb, upper arm is used, but sometimes some people use in the forearm or in the wrist, or some plastic surgeons, even in the fingers, digital uh, tunicates they are using. Generally, a single bladder is used, but for IVRA and some other uh, people use it as a double bladder cuff so that tunica pain can be avoided. It can be used as per availability and convenience. Then proper size, proper pressure, if we do that, then the intramuscular, in, uh, neuromuscular injuries and the tunica ischemia can be reduced as much as possible. Full. How much pressure to put in? That is also one of the things which has to be kept in mind. So 100 to 150 millimeters above the systolic blood pressure for the thigh, lower limb, and 50 to 75 millimeter above the uh, systolic blood pressure in the arm. Another method which people use is 40 to 8 millimeters above the limb occlusion pressure, which is measured by like pressure of the, the pressure is raised and when the, uh, there is a blockade of the arterial pulse, that is the occlusion pressure. So 40 to 80 millimeter above that, depending on the pressure on which this happens. In for pediatric patients, adding 50 millimeters has been recommended. Duration, again, lower extremity is one to three hours, but generally mostly up to two hours. If it the surgery is getting uh, delayed, uh, surgery is longer, then you can give a break of five to 10 minutes of intermittent perfusion and then reapply for another hour accordingly. And in upper extremities, 45 minutes to one and a half hours is generally the time which is being used. In pediatrics, lower extremities, inflation pressure of less than, uh, inflation time is less than 75 millimeters uh, for 75 minutes. Generally, people get wary of after half an hour. And then uh, it is the, I think it is very important for them to be told, surgeon to be reminded of every 15 minutes about the tunica time so that they uh, accordingly manage their surgery. So what these complications can happen is the nerve injury, arterial spasm, venous thrombosis, or transient systemic metabolic acidosis once we release this. Hypotension can happen when the tunica is released. One is because the blood goes from the general circulation to the, or even people have seen cardiac arrest happening. 
So when this tunica is released, there is a transient rise of uh, carbon dioxide levels, heart rate, and the potassium levels. Tunica pain, whenever it happens, definitive treatment is the release, but then the giving of the block, skin uh, uh, infiltrations, etc. Tunica. Again, nerve uh, paresthesia or paralysis can happen in the post-operative period. For the upper limb, in one in uh, incidence is one in 6200 or one in 3700 in lower limbs, mostly heals within six months. Muscle injury caused because of the metabolic and microvascular changes. Vascular injury is uncommon, but in children and obese patients and people with peripheral vascular disease, sometimes vascular injury can also take place. And skin injury in terms of abrasion, blisters, and pressure necrosis. So, in summary, when we see there are patient-related issues, disease-related issues, and surgical-related issues. So once we uh, get them in our picture of, uh, picture of uh, planning, we can have a very safe and comfortable anesthesia for the patient, or the orthopedic patients. Now, some of the things which have not been covered in this, I think we'll, we'll be having. Uh, one is the joint replacement uh, next week, and another one we'll be having sometime which will have the spine, pain medicine, and uh, uh, all these things covered up. Thank you for your kind attention. Any questions? Uh, thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> that was a very nice and lucid uh, journey right from the preoperative period, uh, right up to the <clears throat> specific concerns that uh, there may be with the ortho orthopedic uh, anesthesia. Uh, as you mentioned, some of the specific topics will be covered at a later date uh, regarding knee replacement, the joint replacements and all. Sir, uh, I do not see uh, uh, many questions or queries in the chat box. So I guess uh, the, the things are uh, very clear to all our postgraduates and all the listeners. Uh, what, uh, uh, what I would like to know, sir, suppose there is some postgraduate who gets an orthopedic case. What uh, are the questions that uh, the, that he should expect uh, in the uh, in the viva? What what do you ask uh, when when uh, when they have a long case of uh, let's say fracture neck femur? What, what should they prepare uh, specifically? Well, uh, I think I uh, I should have told it in the beginning itself. One is that what are whatever these specific uh, uh, concerns which I have mentioned. They generally have a short uh, note or, you know, in the question paper in the theory as one of the things, one of these things of tunique or fat embolism syndrome. So they should prepare it as a uh, short uh, question uh, which can be asked them. Second is normally the questions which are asked in the theory is like in orthopedics, there are not too many other questions asked. But whatever the questions are asked is like, suppose a patient of 70 years or 75 years or 65 year old patient with disease ABC coming for joint replacement, knee replacement, how would you manage? Or it is that a patient of 80 year old uh, with some comorbidities comes with fracture of neck of femur. So how to uh, proceed right from beginning till the end, how to manage that patient? when to take them up, when not to take them up, what complications, what problems. So that's how generally this whole thing is taken. So when we had this talk beginning, so we had this thing uh, marked out in terms of, if you see that patient factors, you know, yes. surgical factors and all that. So when you are approaching this, because it is not only the orthopedic problem, which has to be accessed and answered. And when the examiner comes, they will ask you, suppose patient is there for whatever surgery, and you say that patient is having a CAD problem or had a CABG in the past. So he will take his whole thing to, in I, this thing to CABG and then proceed on to that. And then how is it going to impact this surgery? Does it have any effect on that? So mainly, mostly the comorbidities in terms of patient, they will be the main focus of their discussion, along with some of these extra factors which are there, like say joint surgery, they are done under tourniquet, 
how their embolization taking place, how to do their, uh, uh, how to do uh, uh, prevention of uh, the thromboembolic phenomena, DVTs, all that. Yes, sir. So, uh, as, I, as I saw in your lecture, you had very uh, beautifully mentioned related uh, factors related to the patient, patient related factors, then the disease related factors, and the surgery related factors. That is how uh, the, these questions need to be dealt. Uh, sir, what I've done is I have uh, allowed uh, all the speakers to unmute themselves just in case there is some uh, query or question or uh, if there is some experience that uh, some of our experienced members might want to share. Uh, they are free to uh, unmute themselves and express themselves uh, and we, we can discuss uh, their experiences and their queries. Uh, in the meantime, sir, yeah, what Dr. Is Mubarak. Dr. Mubarak, Mubarak is here right from beginning. I guess he right, can sir. add a lot to... Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I was I was uh, keenly listening to your lecture throughout, and yeah. and for me there is nothing much left to be spoken for the next week. You have extensive without mentioning the term total knee replacement and total hip replacement. You have covered everything in in orthopedics. It was and I think it will be a repetition for me for the next next week almost no 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 <laughs> i think I, I i have a different this thing because when you when you put it in that slot yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Like when the things come in then they'll be able to answer that as i said you have all those factors so when you are approaching any problem has those factors one by one so then your answer would be you know in yeah. in flow so, so when you put it in the slot for them in a joint replacement they'll be delighted yeah, yeah, but now what I meant was uh, you have uh, covered the entire area of orthopedic scene within this one, hour, one, one, one and a half hours, including all the aspects, including bone swing syndrome, everything. It, it applies to shoulder replacement also, but uh, and it was in a very systematic way from the beginning itself. And I was really impressed with your presentation. And this is the first time I am interacting with you. I have, I have been not, never been met or spoken with you. So, thank you so much. So, and it's been a pleasure that you've been yeah. uh, there throughout with support. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Okay. Dr. Anita, Dr. Anita Kohli has uh, raised her hand. If there is anything, Dr. Anita, you want to mention? Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, a patient in emergency for fracture uh, neck of femur on a dual platelet uh, uh, like regime. So, how do you proceed for emergency on dual platelet patient of IHD? See, this is one of the, uh, you know, the most difficult controversies in the orthopedic anesthesia. And that involves basically the fracture neck femur uh, or the uh, intertrochantic fracture. Why is it so difficult to uh, resolve is because they say whenever a patient of, like in West, whenever a patient of... Uh, fracture neck femur or intertrochantric fracture comes, it should be taken up as early as possible to reduce the morbidity and mortality in the post-operative period. Yes, sir. But what happens is in most of the cases, they have so many comorbidities because generally these are the people who are 65, 70 plus, and they have so many comorbidities and issues involved, including, as you said, uh, double uh, uh, anticoagulant therapy. So what the, what, has been happening is now what they are suggesting that it is not necessary that you have to wait if you feel you want to go in. It is not necessary that you wait for five days or seven days and then undertake the surgery. They are taking the surgery earlier than uh, what has what used to be prescribed earlier. And now they say that, I mean, some of the places where they have uh, uh, the facilities for platelet uh, function uh, analysis, or they say that have platelets ready, get the surgery done, don't give uh, uh, blo neural blocks, they get them done under general anesthesia and pitch in with your platelets and everything in case there is an excessive bleeding. Uh, and because some of the uh, surgeons and some of the uh, implants which are available now these days, uh, the amount of uh, damage they do to the tissue for its, uh, uh, you know, uh, the whole procedure is very, very limited, very short time. 
and as you know they make an you know half about an inch of a incision max and then they go through that and the uh, the time which they used to take in getting into the canal and everything now it, because of the implants and the equipment which they have they use i mean in our place like they do it within 15 to 20 minutes they are over and out so uh, i think if facilities are available the place is geared up and patient doesn't have any other issues which will need to be addressed like if the patient has 300 400 uh, uh, sugar levels or acute ischemic uh, changes or something then you probably would have to hold on till you optimize them and then take them up right so i would like to add in this question uh, because our aim should be to do the surgery as far as as fast as possible and not to delay due to medical reasons because early intervention is not only for humanitarian consideration of pain relief the chance of fat embolism and the patient outcome is delirium every all the complications are lessened in early sur- sur- surgery so our aim should be to take up as early as possible preferably as sir said by uh, with general anesthesia and other uh, supportive measures thank you sir so uh, so what about damage control sir the role of damage control in this uh, orthopedics basically they i mean whenever they come right what we want to avoid is as uh, dr mubarak very rightly said fat embolism and all those things happening so proper traction being applied make them immobile from that point of view so that there is no more uh, you know moving movement of the uh, fractured areas get their things improved as much as possible as fast as possible because now what they say is that if if we do surgery within hours that is the key to do this and as dr mubarak also pointed out as fast as possible but then in our situations like in our conditions we have many other issues involved in this like in say government hospital if the person goes how much time would it get for the traction to be made available and traction to be applied and then the patient stabilized and you know all those things or say in private setup where the patient is there everything is there but the financial thing is not clear or the relation is not there to give the consent or the you know they are not willing to give consent because they say that baba ji 90 years ke hain to hum to nahi karate abhi so there are so many other issues involved but as as pointed out uh, here it should be done as early as possible and with minimum problems uh, uh, other than that thank you sir thank you yeah thank you dr anita uh, so the similar question has been asked by dr ashwini uh, regarding urgency now this is a common problem that we have faced as residents when we were residents and now maybe as also as faculty what is an urgent orthopedic uh, surgery what is an emergent orthopedic surgery is it urgent to repair fracture neck femur or intertrochanteric fracture and sir uh, if you could just uh, stop sharing the slides then all the uh, uh, videos will be there on the website sir if you can stop sharing the slides yeah so uh, stop share is there sir on the top uh, red uh, red button sir yes sir so uh, is it uh, urgent to repair fracture neck femur or inter country can what will constitute an emergent uh, orthopedic surgery uh, if you talk about the urgent uh, surgeries for fractures so this is one of the uh, surgeries which is considered as an urgent surgery to be done as early as possible as an as uh, must be treated as an emergent surgery because other emergent surgeries are in orthopedics are the ones where they fracture patient bleeding you know even in those cases the fixation is not the idea the fixation i mean the actual fixation is not the idea there what they do is they debride control the bleeding put in external fixators dress the wound get the patient optimized and then take them up for uh, surgery of uh, actual uh, surgery which is to be required later at the later stage 
but as as this uh, is becoming more and more important from point of view of morbidity and mortality because they have seen that whether you do surgery or you don't do surgery unfortunately this is one disease which is having a very high morbidity and mortality and from the surgical point of view as the time passes the morbidity and mortality uh, ratio goes up because if you see even in a traditional uh, this thing old people are worried with one single thing and that is fracture of the hip if you see in villages or something baba ji would be his this thing would be that he doesn't want to have this and if they know that some of his friend has it they feel oh my god he is now going to go away right so Very over the period of time with our science going in we have found with experience that earlier we do better it is and as dr mubarak said we should try and do it as early as possible taking all precaution and safety things in mind sir i would also again uh, like to add a few points regarding this because uh, in especially in in fracture fee femur and all it occurs in geriatric patients they will be having comorbidities as, like coronary artery disease and all and in such cases inadequate pain relief if the surgery is delayed you should provide good pain relief otherwise that pain itself will cause a ischemic event and the, and pain relief is uh, is one of the um, goals in the earlier orthopedic surgery and as i told earlier the chance of having a fat, fat embolism and other complications are also lessened by early surgery so the aim should be to provide good good pain relief and do early surgery as possible Right, yeah, in some of the I mean, like now the emergency medicine has come up as a very very important speciality, which was yes. lacking in all over the world. But now even in India we are having emergency surgery departments. So now what is being done in many other and some places in South I know, where when the patient comes to the casualty with a fracture of the limb, they are given nerve blocks within few minutes, you know. uh as as a kind of first emergency treatment besides getting x ray and everything that give the block and then they send them for x rays and you know all those things and that makes as dr mubarak is saying life much easier more comfortable and less movement patient is comfortable and the morbidity mortality is low yes sir uh, another concern with orthopedics is uh, infection as you had mentioned sir so what what is uh, your institute protocol regarding antibiotics before uh, before surgery sir we have a antibiotic uh, antibiotic policy uh, in place which is being reviewed this thing most of the times like in our setup uh, supercef is the one which is the primary antibiotic of choice if you are not using this in orthopedic surgery if you are not using this and using some other higher uh, antibiotic then generally there is a form to be filled up and the reason to be given why that antibiotic is being is to be taken up say for culture report or something and then further escalation is done according to the uh, culture reports and discussion and not just like uh, any antibiotic Timing, sir. Uh, is it a sixty-minute window, thirty-minute window before the surgery? For routine surgery, uh, I mean, it's a protocol, and like those pre-operative form to be filled up. Then there is a, as as we all know, the uh, patient later we have to have that uh, quality forms and everything, which says which desires antibiotic to be given within sixty minutes of incision. Within sixty minutes. correct sir so uh, uh dr roshan has mentioned about the uh, pericapsular infiltration uh, in uh, nip, uh, knee and uh, hip joint replacement i guess dr mubarak sir will be discussing uh, uh, all these things in the uh, next time the perioperative and uh, analgesia uh, dr mohan pathak uh, has raised his hand sir could you please unmute yourself and ask uh, or uh, share your views dr mohan pathak you need to unmute yourself Dr. Mohan Patha uh, has raised. You raised your hand, sir. Is there anything that you wish to add to the discussion? Low molecular weight heparin. Low molecular weight heparin. How far it is helpful? Uh, 
uh, in what purpose sir for uh, dvt profile access uh, to prevent thromboembolism low molecular weight heparin in orthopedic surgery post op so, yes yes so yes, uh, yes sir, it is yes it's a very very valid point which we have raised this is very very essential and now given in practically all the patients only yes, thing is that yes. timing has to be uh, done according to the uh, surgery which has been done and the status of the wound and the status of the uh, uh, whatever surgery has been done most of the yes. times like uh, as dr mubarak would be telling you to, uh, in the next time like in joint surgeries which you do practically pre operatively many a people uh, have a protocol of giving uh, um, low molecular weight heparin and the post operatively 6 hours and above uh, same day and then follow it up so it has definite role and all those patients all those How patients who have had lower limb surgeries or pelvic surgeries they it is or spinal surgeries this is uh, rule of the game how long yes. it should be given well that's a little uh, topic of discussion but then you know 3 weeks 6 weeks depending upon the comorbidities and all that they are continued most of the time like in our place all those patients who have uh, uh, joint replacement like uh, hip and knee in the normal course of events without too many added uh, uh, comorbidities they have it during the week or five days six days which they have it here and then a week later at home they have it and then if they have some issues with the uh, or uh, extra risk factors so they are they go on to oral things uh, for uh, three to six weeks yes oral uh, anticoagulant how far they are helpful <laughs> well uh, i think uh, i think it is something uh, uh how they can prevent uh, thromboembolic phenomena some people would not be very happy to accept that as easily as other people would do because now in the world many places people are not giving any any of these things even for yes yes knee and hip replacements yes. many centers because they are going yes. in for mobility factors early mobilization yeah they say that if they you can mobilize the patient they would not yes. give it many yes. places in uh, uh, australia uh, they are not giving any any of these things not to give uh-huh. but then you know when when you have a patient who has not moved out of the bed for last 6 7 years and yes. comes for a joint replacement or some major surgery or fracture you don't yes. expect them to be out of the bed <laughs> when they have had surgery because they they were not even out yes, of the yes. bed they were all right so in those patients it has to be given yeah it has to be used thank you sir thank uh, you thank you sir and uh, okay. i i i do not see any other question uh, or any other query doctor agnihotri sir is here uh, he is a senior uh, stalwart of isa sir is there anything that you wish to add before we can just uh, wind up Uh, Dr. Agnihotri, sir. Right, sir. It's a very uh, wonderful lecture, yes, sir. sir. And it is a well connected regarding the orthopedics problems for the postgraduates. Yes. I hope yes. the new generation will learn the art of orthopedic anesthesia in that fashion. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma, for your great lecture. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Agnihotri. for being there so thanks sharma hope you will be there next week along with me also sure sure thank you so much <laughs> okay. Okay. so thank you thank you so much uh, dr sharma sir dr surender sharma that was absolutely very nice and the discussions were also very good i'm sure it will be of great use to all the post graduates and all the young consultants and private practitioners also uh because orthopedics is a very very important uh, aspect of anesthesia and uh, thank you mubarak sir uh, we are uh, eagerly looking forward to the next week where you shall be discussing the anesthetic concerns and management of uh, hip replacement and knee replacement
So with this, uh, I think we can uh, wind up now. And uh, once again, sir, thank you so much for sparing your time and for the wonderful, wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.